in black to set the content and the program for a weekend long, sometimes longer than a weekend long, uh, series of uh, residential uh, conferences, which we call the Academy. And for those of us uh, involved in organizing the event, and I know for many of you who've been involved in some of those events over the years, and for some of you who've been to every one of the academies, I think it really is an intellectual highlight uh, of the year. The Academy is intended as a forum, spatial and temporal, where people with an interest in culture, politics, history, ideas, art, and literature can come together for a weekend of lectures, seminars, book group discussions, film showings, and debates. It's an intellectual space in which we try to step back from the immediate demands of the present and to reflect upon how we got here, on how the ideas of the past have shaped the debates of, of the now and of what we can learn from some of the great books and thinkers and intellectual traditions that have come before us. Over the past 10 years, the Academy has been organized around a number of core themes, around history and consciousness, free will and determinism, man and nature, morality, the public, Europe, the rise and fall of the self, uh, sovereignty, and last year, uh, the culture wars. And until the 23rd of March this year, 2020, when we all began to spend perhaps a little bit more time uh, in the house than we were used to, um, the Academy 2020 was in, in full process. We had a series of lectures and sessions uh, booked and scheduled in to begin a weekend long uh, uh, session uh, this weekend on the theme of the exhaustion of political language. And I know that many of you had already begun preparing uh, for those discussions. So I want to say rest assured that the Academy offline, the live Academy as it were, will return. You can still remember perhaps those, th those days back in history when a few hundred people were allowed to gather together in a shared space without face masks, without the whiff of uh, sanitizer gel uh, in the background. That time will return and so will the Academy live. Not as tragedy, not even as farce, but as a joyous intellectual celebration which we can all look forward to. That, however, I think will be next year. And as soon as we know exactly how it's going to work uh, or, 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 or when it's going to be scheduled, uh, we will let you know. So today isn't going to be quite like uh, other academies, but I'd like to uh, really seriously invite you all to work together with everyone here to make it uh, the next best thing. In every academy to date, we've had uh, plenary sessions and breakout sessions and a choice of simultaneous strands uh, and themes to choose from. And we've drawn our inspiration really quite widely from history, the arts, literature, and philosophy. And you'll see from the programme today that we're trying to do all of those things uh, virtually and in a slightly more compacted form uh, for today. So our theme is psychology and democracy. We're gonna begin in a few minutes with an introductory lecture by Jacob Reynolds on the frightful crowd, the psychology of the masses. And then you have a choice of three book club sessions. Dr. Helena Goldberg will be introducing a discussion on Walden II, the 1948 utopian novel by psychologist and radical behaviorist B.F. Skinner. Ella Whelan will be introducing a discussion on Lady Chatterley's lover, D.H. Lawrence's infamous novel uh, published in 1928. And then Professor James Woodhausen will be introducing on The Hidden Persuaders, Vance Packard's 1957 critique of the consumerism and an increasingly psychologically focused advertising industry. The idea, which I hope is, is, is obvious to many of you, is that you choose one of these sessions, and most of you have already done that and indicated your preference. If you haven't, that's not a problem. You simply join whichever of the three sessions you'd like to join. So to talk you through what may be straightforward for many people, but in case it isn't, if you want to join the Lady Chatterley session, uh, that will be taking place in, in this Zoom room. So you can either just stay logged in after the opening lecture, or you can nip out and rejoin at 12.30. And for that, you'll be using the link, the BOI, .co.uk forward slash Lawrence. If you're going to be attending the Skinner session, you'll be logging into a new Zoom session at 12.30 using the link the boi.co.uk forward slash Skinner. And if you're going to be attending the Packard session, your room link is the boi.co.uk forward slash Packard. Even I can understand this. Links for these sessions are going to be posted in the chat box. Um, they're also going to be up uh, at the end of this lecture. And if anyone gets uh, confused or discombobulated about where you are or where you're supposed to be, you just need to go back to the original email that you received from Jeff Kidder, which gives you details of all of the sessions and how to log in. After we've had those um, optional three uh, book strand sessions, we're then gonna have a short break and reconvene again in this uh, major space, in this large space, if you like, and we're gonna have a lecture from uh, Professor Frank Ferredi kicking off a discussion on scientism and the manufacture of consent then and now. 
There are, I think, some obvious disadvantages to us meeting like this rather than all together in one place. The most obvious of which is that it's nice to be all together, giving introductions, sharing ideas, contributing to the discussion, and then uh, importantly, continuing those discussions over lunch and dinner and drinks, and very often into the wee small hours. Um, I've heard from a couple of people who say that they're feeling very fresh, uh, uh, unhung over uh, and rearing to go this morning in a way that they aren't always uh, on the first day of an academy. Um, that's fantastic. The academy has a collegiate uh, feel to it normally. Um, it's organized by a small team, but it's really made by the work that everyone who attends puts in to preparing for the discussions and then to having those discussions in lectures and seminars and breaks over the course of a weekend. If this is the first time you've attended an academy, I should make clear that our speakers are gonna be giving introductory lectures for uh, around about 30 minutes or so before the room is opened up for everyone else who wants to comment and contribute to the discussion. To avoid too much noise at the moment, you are all currently on mute, but when you want to speak after the introductory lecture, you just need to raise your virtual hand and I'll come to you and in the later sessions, the chair will come to you for your contribution. Knowing some of the regular academy uh, audience as I do, um, I don't imagine that anyone is going to be shy in contributing, but if you haven't been before, um, you don't have to speak, but throwing some ideas and questions and comments into the mix is really what this session is all about, so please don't feel shy. You will also notice, I think, that this session is being recorded and the later sessions today are going to be recorded, so we're going to be packaging some of the lectures together uh, with potentially some of the discussion after today so that you can rewatch it. I guess I also wanted to note that while there are certain negatives of us not all meeting together uh, in the uh, same place, um, with any new challenge, there are new opportunities. And so while there are limitations to doing this virtually, there are also some very great advantages. Uh, one of the advantages is obviously that people who can't join us for a whole residential weekend have been able to sign up to join us online today. Other people who couldn't normally attend the academy at all uh, because they live abroad have been able to log in. And it's, it's a real pleasure to see many of you uh, uh, logged in today. And then there are quite a few people in the audience, I think, who uh, haven't been to a previous academy. And so this is an ideal opportunity to try it out, see what it's all about. Uh, uh, and you are all very welcome uh, wherever you are coming from. Another advantage of today is that the event is significantly cheaper than putting on and attending our usual residential event. Indeed, tickets you will have noticed are free. Uh, there was no bouncer on the door. Nonetheless, if you value what is happening here today and you're in the fortunate position, which I hope many of you are, not to have had your bank balances hit too hard by COVID, um, I, I would uh, ask that you consider making a donation towards your attendance at the Academy. Uh, the Academy is brought together by a whole load of people working uh, voluntarily uh, and by a small team working very hard. But the BOI charity has a, a core team who've been working throughout lockdown and there are many obvious costs associated in pulling an event like this together. Uh, so your donation really helps make this day possible and helps make uh, future events possible. As I say the word donate, I notice that as if by magic, uh, my co-host Rob has posted uh, the link in the chat box that you need to use. So um, if uh, by any uh, strange uh, happenstance you, you, you begin to drift in and out with what I'm saying, you can um, uh, focus your attention on clicking the link uh, and making a donation, and that would be very much appreciated. I'm not gonna talk for too much longer but before I introduce Jacob to give the opening lecture, I, I do just want to say a, a couple of things about our theme today and how it fits in with, with what we've done uh, uh, in the Academy generally and what we try to do. The Academy is all about stepping back from the present and reflecting upon what the ideas and intellectual traditions from the past can teach us about our current experience. And it's also about trying to dig down into the origins and developments of some of those ideas and trends that shape the political and intellectual and cultural uh, landscape of the present. This is always an important task, but to me it seems uh, almost more important than ever in the current climate as we lurch from the debacle around Brexit through the COVID pandemic to the explosion of public outrage in Black Lives Matter, uh, all uh, of which invoke different but potentially differently problematic accounts of the demos and the public. Since the first emergence of modern mass democratic society, a core concern for those in authority has always been how to make sense of the public, differently understood as citizens whom, to whom they are accountable, or the masses whose behavior needs careful regulation. The problem is really a problem of how to conceptualize, conceptualize uh, who the public are, how the people come to have certain ideas and opinions and values, how they come to make the decisions that they make, how they come to behave, and perhaps from time to time misbehave. 
As politics has become ever more managerial and technocratic, so have the attempts to understand the ideas and behavior in the demos and to find points of connection with them. Increasingly, uh, these have come to invoke the language of psychology and behavioral sciences, and, and in recent years, even the language of epidemiology and most recently still virology. These categories invoke, I think, the authority of science to explain human behavior. And one thing we might want to explore today is the extent to which society can be properly explained and behavior properly understood in these terms. Let me give you an example. Writing in his Spectator column last month, Rory Sutherland, vice chair of the ad company Ogilvy UK, he sought to explain why it has taken the COVID pandemic to convince us all of something that wise sages like Rory have known for a long time, which is that remote working, home working has many advantages, he thinks, for both employees and employers. What was interesting was the nature of Sutherland's explanation. Virology teaches us, he said, that ideas don't naturally become adopted any more than bad ideas immediately die out. This is because the adoption of new ideas and behaviors spread much like a virus, by contagion. Behavior is contagious because we catch it from other people. So here ideas spread, not because they are good or bad, convincing or unconvincing, or even because they are right or wrong, reflected upon rationally, chosen by individuals who are convinced by argument. No, no, ideas catch on, behaviors spread and are adopted in much the same way that coronavirus catches on, is caught, is spread, without reason or decisions entering the fray. Maybe it's no surprise, maybe it's only slightly depressing, that an ad man looks at ideas as commodities to sell to a more or less gullible, unthinking public. But explanations of this kind seem to have a lot of resonance and purchase. We regularly discuss the internet as a realm in which ideas go viral. To give you a different example, at the height of the Dominic Cummings imbroglio, Stephen Reicher, professor of psychology at the University of St Andrews and a member of the behavioral science wing, of the government's scientific advisory group for emergencies or SAGE, Riker tweeted an attack on Cummings. As one of those involved in the government advisory group on behavioral science, he tweeted, I can say that in a few short minutes tonight, Johnson and Cummings have trashed all the advice that we have given on how to build trust and secure adherence to the measures necessary to control COVID-19. Be open and honest, we said, trashed. Respect the public, we said, trashed. Ensure equity so that everyone is treated the same, we said, trashed. Be consistent, we said, trashed. Make it clear we are all in this together, we said, trashed. These tweets were liked hundreds of thousands of times. The following day, Riker proudly announced, this morning we submitted the manuscript of our book on the psychology of COVID-19. It will be available in a few weeks, and we explain the importance of understanding and harnessing group psychology in dealing with the pandemic. It might seem obvious that psychologists and behavioral scientists have played such a central role in providing expert advice to government on how to deal with the current pandemic. But if that does seem obvious, well, that's, that's, very, that's very much the obviousness, if you like, that we want to try and interrogate today. How did government so readily come to the view that the way it deals with a global health crisis or with demonstrations in the street or with predicting the behavior of voters, how did they so readily come to understand that these have to be approached through the categories of psychology and in behavioralist terms. So I'm really pleased that to uh, guide us with some introductory thoughts on the intellectual and political history of how these, uh, the institutions of contemporary society came under the spell of the psychological and behavioral sciences. I'm gonna be handing over in just a second to uh, Jacob Reynolds, who's gonna to talk to us about the frightful crowd and the psychology of the masses. Jacob will be known to many of you as the uh, uh, BOI uh, Charities um, uh, Manager uh, of External Affairs. He also looks after the Debating Matters competition, the debating competition for sixth form students, and he convenes Living Freedom, a summer school for young people interested in the philosophy of freedom. Jacob previously worked as a consultant with a focus on behaviour change and leadership, so very appropriate that he is uh, introducing the Academy today with the first lecture. He has a BPhil in philosophy from Oxford, where he specialised in a continental and political philosophy, and he continues to write about philosophy and foreign literature. I'm also very uh, grateful to him, and I should just note uh, in passing that he's one of the core team who's put a tremendous amount of effort into very quickly uh, pulling together uh, this event and making it all work in many levels today. So um, uh, a big thanks and a welcome from us all uh, to Jacob, who's gonna talk for uh, about 30 minutes, and then I will open up the floor uh, to all of you. Uh, Jacob. Hi everyone, uh, I say I hope you can hear me. It's obviously slightly strange to 
do a lecture looking out my window and seeing a, a group of small people, small faces sort of in my uh, screen rather than in front of me. But hopefully this will work. And also noting that I no longer have to sort of try and project my voice or shout. So if I, if I start shouting, I'll have to, someone just tell me to rein it in. Um, I mean, on this topic, it's hard to know where to begin, but what I want to do is sort of whiz through a period of history where the crowd or the mass became a serious object of study and more importantly, an object of concern. I want to focus on how it was understood and denigrated indeed in specifically psychological terms. Now, as Jim indicated from my introduction, I mean, I'm not a historian. I'm by training, as it were, a philosopher. So my focus will be more on the intellectual history than the often messy historical reality. If you do feel that I've missed any key historical details that challenge the intellectual narrative, then of course you can take me to task um, once I've finished. Of course, the mob or the multitude has always been treated at best suspiciously by the elite. We can find uh, the basic outlines of this elite suspicion as old or indeed older, but certainly as old as Plato. Um, and the beginnings as well of the psychologization of this elite suspicion. So Plato saw the human being as a war between reason and appetite, to put it bluntly. Um, usually reason would be overwhelmed by the unrestrained demands of appetite. Now this was as much a political parable as a psychological theory. So for Plato, the best, most reasonable men like Socrates were liable to being overwhelmed by the insatiable and unreasonable demands of the mob. The philosopher king for Plato is the doctor of the soul and proper management of politics is paternalistic and therapeutic. It makes people better in their own interest. The other piece of background I want to mention, um, creating really a potted uh, history of ideas, but the other piece of background is that as much as the enlightenment um, constituted what many would term the emancipation of the individual, it was often cast or understood in what especially now we might see as psychological terms. This is especially true of enlightenment empiricism. So Locke stresses the role of impressions in creating the self and that what people experience is paramount. So as much as what I'll come on to discuss as the psychological devaluation of the people of the mass, as much as that represents an attack or an undermining of the traditional enlightenment self, it doesn't come completely from nowhere. It doesn't come completely from without that tradition. So bearing all that in mind, the sort of meat of the, of the discussion, um, the major jumping off point for the authors we're discussing is the increasingly crowd-like character of modern society. Even before crowds and crowd psychology became an explicit preoccupation of intellectual interest, the conditions of crowd society we're beginning to worry even liberal writers. So consider Alexis de Tocqueville. He said, I see, he's imagining the future. He says, I see an immunerable crowd of like and equal men who revolve on themselves without repose. Each of them withdrawn and apart, exists for himself and himself alone. But above these, an immense tutelary power is elevated, which alone takes charge of assuming their enjoyments and watching over their fate. What, moreover, is John Stuart Mill's dreaded conformity of society, but an expression of fear about the deadening influence of the large powerful crowd on the individual? In less sympathetic, less liberal writers, the strain of snobbery is, is less concealed. It's the mere presence for many intellectuals of the tasteless crowds swarming the theatres, the galleries and the streets in their pitiful Sunday best that arouses their distaste. The masses were, for many intellectuals, considered beyond help. And, and the intellectuals, as Ella Whelan will discuss, I'm sure, in her talk on Lady Chatterley's Lover, the intellectuals preferred unspoiled, natural man. So this is the sense of the crowd as the dark side of modern society. And this is obviously so well explored by John Carey and the intellectuals and the masses, and it provides the backdrop, it underlies the fear of the crowd. This, then brings us to Gustave Le Bon, born in 1841, published the book on the reading list, The Psychology of Crowds in 1895. He was, it has to be admitted, a remarkable polymath and was 
probably unfairly shunned by the French academic establishment of his day. In addition to this feeling of being an outsider, he was rather clearly formed, I think, by three influences. His medical training, his humbling experience in the Franco-Prussian War, and the Paris Commune of 1871. From Lee's, he became, I think, convinced that civilization was always at risk from the stupidity and the effeminacy of the crowd, and that in the modern era, the elite's grip on power was at best tenuous. So in his words, he says, while all, and I'm sure um, even if you flick through, you might have got this because it is on only the first couple of pages, but he's, it's the key thing, he says, while all our ancient beliefs are tottering and disappearing, while the old pillars of society are giving way one by one, the power of the crowd is the only force that nothing menaces, and of which the prestige is continually on the increase. The age we are entering will in truth be the era of crowds. Now, what did he think of crowds? I mean, in one way, his view basically mirrors the etymology of the French word for crowd, fool, when, which is both a group, but also etymologically uh, to be trampled, oppressed, crushed. I'm sure these connotations uh, came to mind when he was discussing it. And this is indeed his view. I mean, another quote from him, from the mere fact that he forms part of an organized crowd, a man descends several rungs in the ladder of civilization. Now, the civilizational me metaphor is ambivalent. It's obviously on the one hand, a regression. It signals the irrationality and horde-like character of the crowd. But we shouldn't forget that the Bond's also impressed by the capacity of crowd for acts of heroism and patriotism. So there's this ambivalence. Now, if with Plato, the distaste, that one side of it of the crowd is nothing new. The Bond, I think, takes things further in three important respects. The first is that he insists on studying the crowd as a new kind of entity. It's not the sum of its parts. It's a new thing, not just comprised by the individuals that make it up. And like anything, it can be studied, understood, dissected scientifically. The second is that as the individual merges into the crowd, the subconscious comes to the fore. The crowd is governed not by reasons, but unconscious impulses. It operates through contagion and suggestion. Feelings and desires catch on, and it thinks in suggestive images, not in words. Again, you might see the link to Plato with the visual myths and allegories that Plato insisted the intellectuals would have to use to guide the multitude. So while the crowd can be understood for the bond, the scientists can at least, it can't be engaged with consciously or rationally. Third, because it acts according to observable scientific laws, the crowd can be manipulated. The elite can understand how it behaves and plant the right suggestions. So in place of the ideal of a rational democratic ordering of society, there'll be the use of devices to subtly shift sentiment. The elites who remember the bonfields are under attack from all sides, they'll learn to fade into the background as the master manipulators, or else they will perish. They'll be tempted to unleash the forces of the crowd, but they'll quickly be overcome if they do. Before we move on, I want to give a quick indication that the bond's not an isolated reactionary. I mean, first, the feeling of leveling standards, the downsides of equalitization, civilizational degeneration, mass irrationality, all of this gripped all of Europe. Indeed, if you want to go back to last year's Academy, which is lots of it's available online, you'll be able to listen to Tim Black's brilliant lecture, which covered a lot of these similar themes of this feeling of civilizational degeneration. Second, the bomb was read widely in Germany, Austria, the UK and beyond. Accounts of the period stress that French crowd psychology the Bond's crowd psychology, occupied the prime place in European discourse. Indeed, his stress on suggestion, the influence of the unconscious, this caught the imagination of a European reading public who were, to some degree, obsessed with the practice of hypnosis. Then, as the 20th century opened, sociology began to take the Bond as axiomatic. In the UK, 1908 saw the publication of books by both William McDougall and Wilfred Trotter, 
who both attempted to use the language of crowd psychology to address this same widespread irrationality they saw. And the same year in Germany saw Georg Simmel publish his sociology, which featured the Bonn-like descriptions of crowds. The slightly complicating factor, um, or at least something to take note, is that the same period in the United States is slightly different. It's more straightforward, more pragmatic, less obsessed by the subconscious. Prominent figures like James M. Williams thought that behavior is largely explained by motives. And then I imagine him stating this in quite Puritan language, but motives are based, he says, on instincts which are molded into learning and habit into dispositions. Typical subjects in American psychology and sociology were not riots or stampedes, but rote learning, education, medical ethics, and labor relations. So even if in the United States, it is more straightforward, um, I don't think it's for that reason less psychologistic. As the reference to labor relations indicates, the sociology and psychology in America was still aimed at providing elites with the tools to manage society. Now, against this backdrop of European thought, at least, particularly the obsession with hypnosis and the focus on the subconscious, the originality of Sigmund Freud is, might seem less pronounced. Indeed, in his 1921 essay, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, the work proceeds with approving quotations of McDougall and the Bonn, and much of Freud's own descriptions could be easily been lifted from either of those two authors. What is slightly different though, is the way that Freud places the subconscious on a new and allegedly more scientific footing. Previous authors, and especially you'll have got the sense from reading the Bond, they present suggestibility and contagion as almost magical phenomena. There's no explanation. There's no sense of how they operate. They're just stated. Freud complains. He says gruffly, there's been no explanation of the nature of suggestion. So Freud comes along and with what he always stresses is his experimental psychoanalytic method. He feels he's got a more rigorous, more scientific basis for his theorizing. He doesn't like the Bonn sort of pluck explanations out of thin air based on his travels. And he doesn't ex insist on the existence of the subconscious. Now, we don't really have the time to explain in detail the component parts of Freud's theories, but we should note though that the schematism of the person that Freud makes into the ego, the id and the superego, and the emphasis on erotic or libidinal loving energy as the primary source of action, these are in many ways are a scientific and psychological recasting of Plato's theory of the soul. What matters for us um, though, is that the unconscious mind was put on a more scientific footing. Indeed, as I mentioned, much in the tradition of Locke and of the Enlightenment, for Freud, we are shaped by our impressions and experiences. Freud puts forward a mechanism for how this happens, and his mechanism stresses that these experiences, which are so crucial to shaping us, they never really leave us. They remain buried within the surface, incorporated at the subconscious level in the conflict between the ego, id, and superego. So it might seem odd to us now when so many of Freud's specific theories from the primal horde to the Oedipal complex, when they enjoy so little legitimacy. But the major legacy, I think, of Freud's um, work, especially for elite theories of group psychology and mass society, was the scientific or supposedly scientific grounding given to ideas of the unconscious. Now, I have to indicate a bit of a, a gap I'm gonna have to skip over, and that's the influence of the two wars on the story I'm telling of the psychologization of the masses. I mean, crudely and obviously, the destruction of the wars seemed to confirm the assumption that dark, destructive forces lurked under the surface of ordinary life. The period seemed to confirm, both on the left and on the right, and amongst traditional elites and newer or cultural elites, the worst elements of these theories of crowds. Indeed, Freud himself, looking back on the destruction of World War I, and anticipating to some degree the destruction of the second, famously revisited his psychology and first proposed the existence of a death drive and second insisted that there was an irreconcilable conflict between individual and society. The irreconcilable conflict that he talks about in the 1929 work Civilization and its Discontents 
which was apparently originally entitled The Uneasiness of Civilization. And that's what he revisited and went back to. Now, especially for elites, the two wars and the prevailing sense of equalitarianism, that is sort of sense of not just of equality as an idea, but as an increasing social reality, meant they had to find or were preoccupied with finding new ways to govern the mass society. Crucial, of course, were the TV and the radio, not least because they promised elites direct or personal access into every individual home. So whether attempting to sell products or beaming the British royal coronation into homes around the world, the new model saw elites related to isolated individuals, not to society, isolated in their homes, and stressed appealing to drives, feelings, jealousies, fears. In other words, appealing to individuals psychologically conceived. As B.F. Skinner, who we'll hear about from Dr. Goldberg, as B.F. Skinner puts it in the preface um, that he added to Warden II, he sort of captures this mood. He says, the really important questions facing the world today are, not question, are questions not about economics or government, but about the daily lives of human beings. A key part of this story of how post-war elites related to the masses was of course the marketing and PR efforts so thoroughly implemented, especially in the United States. Edward Bernays, Freud's nephew, became a crucial figure, advising corporations, celebrities, and presidents in creating the new discipline of public relations. Ernest Dichter, self-described disciple of Freud's, pioneered the field of motivational research to help companies sell products. Together, they represented a prevailing ideology that saw people as driven by irrational, sub or even unconscious impulses that could be exploited. Now these methods, and the, especially the centrality of them to post-war capitalism, given the spectre of overproduction, these are of course well detailed by Vance Packard, and so I'll leave Professor Woodhausen to shed some light on them a little later. But what's often missed, I think, is that this wasn't conceived as an immoral enterprise. To the contrary, the satisfaction of consumer desires was understood as the way to create a healthier, more secure, happier society. One's reminded, I think, of that famous scene, or to my mind it's famous anyway, the famous scene in Mad Men where Don Draper insists that the essence of advertising is to say, whoever you are, whatever you do, it's okay. Advertising becomes the cure for our nostalgia, the reassurance of our sexual potency, the cradle of our dreams. Bernays, as it happens, tried to get public relations accredited as a medical discipline. So again, like a psychologized Plato, this was the therapeutic paternalism of crowd psychology. Now, when the elite so brazenly understood its role in these terms, it's hardly surprising that many of the post-war radicals were sort of horrified by this sense of mass manipulation. What is perhaps surprising though, is that they fought this psychological manipulation in the name of psychology. However, I mean, since World War II, establishment liberals and to some degree the new radicals were united in believing that there was a psychological explanation to the appeal of fascism and the success of fascist manipulation and propaganda. Echoing the Bond's identification of the tendency for crowds to crave harsh leadership, the new radicals invented the notion of the authoritarian personality. They were convinced that tendencies useful to fascism lay hidden inside the modern individual and were merely waiting for an opportunity to rise to the surface. This, however, very quickly became the self-conscious deployment of psychological categories, not just to explain how things had sometimes gone wrong, but also to explain the alleged resistance of the masses to progressive change going forward. This wasn't a trend just isolated to the Frankfurt School. As indeed, as one account stresses, social psychology was widely integrated into the civil rights movement. But we can, and it helps clarify things, I think, see this very clearly in the writings of Herbert Marcuse. So for Marcuse, a body of lies dominates American life. The lies are there to stop us seeing our real needs. The lies are the fake psychological wants for status and security, or the fake psychological insecurities about appearance or sexuality. These lies manufactured and then satiated through advertising. This society of lies, 
this creation of fake wants, is so all encompassing that society becomes uniform or one dimensional, as the title of his 1964 book puts it. Society satisfies fake wants, and so man forgets his real needs and doesn't rebel against society. Marcuse, of course, of course, is able to identify man's real obscured needs. He's the one who knows. Thinking he's following Freud, he argues that these real needs are erotic, that is creative or loving. In reality, Marcuse turns Freud on his head. Instead of, as for Freud, the healthy person understanding the demands of society and attempting to reconcile them with the demands of their own ego, their own needs. The healthy person for Marcuse is one who shakes off the false demands of society and unleashes the true erotic potential of their own ego. Now, as Christopher Lash, I think, indicated, the desire to weaken or abolish society or the existence of a weakened and abolished society doesn't emancipate the individual ego. It leads to the individual becoming enslaved by their ego. Marcuse's psychology, I think we can see now looking back, is in many respects a sort of precursor to what Lash described as the culture of narcissism. If I could just uh, go into uh, just a touch more detail on this, it's, it's very interesting because Alistair McIntyre published a brilliant and very short uh, critical essay of, uh, of Marcuse. He pointed out that Marcuse was sort of a blend of Marx and Freud, and in a way that was unflattering to both. It brought out the worst elements of them. This is, this is largely true, but isn't entirely right. It's, it's more that he takes, I think, the wrong parts of Marx and Freud. He, in a sort of weird way, takes Freud's sociology, his obsession with the fact that culture has to repress, and he takes Marx's psychology. And this is obviously in contrast to Lash, who takes Freud's psychology and Marx's sociology, are the sort of strong parts of the, of the two. Anyway, at, at any rate, faced with this one-dimensional society of psychologically duped masses, Marcuse argued, as one commentator puts it, that, quote, the only hope of liberating American minds was to ban the lies entirely and convert schools into centers for the correction of thought. Marcuse is indeed refreshingly honest about this. He asks, is there any alternative but a dictatorship of the elite over the people? This is obviously a rhetorical question to which the answer is no, there's no alternative. We're gonna to have to have an elite dictatorship over the people. Above all, Marcuse is motivated by a desire to remake society and produce what he's identified as the missing revolutionary agent. Missing, the, rev the revolution has gone missing because the masses are too satisfied by the false society. The elite that Marcuse speaks of is, as it were, the revolutionary vanguard, but there's no revolutionary subject for it to be the vanguard of. So Marcuse and his friends, the vanguard, they have to make the missing revolutionary subject, the missing revolutionary agent, through a, a radical program. So these are hence Marcuse's demands, take over the university, submit universe, uh, students to cultural and erotic reprogramming, practice what he called repressive tolerance, which was uh, banning books or not allowing, as we'd say, no platforming uh, discriminatory or elite positions, and seek out any social outcasts who might have slipped through the net of the one dimensional society and its psychological programming, hence the focus on dropouts, tramps, sex workers, whatever your sort of favored uh, minority slip through the net is. So in Marcuse and the sort of radical psychological critique of mass society that he was so emblematic of, we see the resistance, uh, sorry, we see the resemblance to the platonic model. The intellectual discovers the true and the rational and remakes society on that basis. But by this point, the in increasing intensification of psychological thinking has turned the platonic model literally inside out. Instead of the truth in all the Plato's metaphors residing up and out there in the eternal forms, for Marcuse the truth resides deep in here buried in the mind. So to condense what was of course a more historical process, a more complicated historical process than I've had time to go into, we see the growth and the consolidation of a paradigm for explaining and then changing the behavior of the masses. This paradigm is fundamentally psychological in the sense that it locates the incapacity of the masses in their emotions and their psychology. 
They're not just wrong or irrational, but also not well. This crowd psychology identifies the irrational and the subconscious with the mass and the conscious and the rational with the elite. It therefore has this twofold character of being explanatory and controlling. Even theories of the crowd like Georges Sorel, who I haven't had time to go into, but who saw in the crowd the possibility of revolution, even those who seem to have so much faith in the possibility of the crowd and the masses, they require the presence of an irrational myth, in Sorel's case, the myth of the general strike, to shake the masses from their slumber and force them into action. Indeed, this focus on myths, symbols, images, statues, is one of the most powerful legacies of the psychological theories of crowds. Now, just to end, I, I wanna go into something I think underlies these visions. So underlying these visions of either technocrats who harness the irrationality of the crowd like Le Bon or Bernays, the radicals who remake society according to the hidden laws of consciousness that they've discovered like Marcuse, or of a revolutionary elite who shock the crowds into the consciousness of their freedom, such as in Sorel. There's a sort of, there's a, a predicament that's worth reflecting on here because it's not an entirely unsympathetic predicament that these intellectuals face. The predicament they face is that of mass society. Now, of course, at worst, we can understand mass society as a mass uniformity of culture. We're all part of one culture and we all think alike. But we don't have to have such a sort of snobbish or elitist view of mass culture to see that mass society is in some sense a more basic sociological fact. It's the absence of distinctive structural social groupings. It's a disarticulated society, not one structured by interlocking social forms and hierarchies. It's a society that's no longer influenced by tradition, authority or religion nor by traditional authoritative or religious powers. This, I think, has some purchase as a genuine sociological description of, the, of society as it's unfolded. And so for the elites, this the, the theories of crowds, they promise a way of pulling the levers of mass society when the levers aren't there anymore. They can instead manipulate psychological tendencies. As much as this strikes us as nefarious, it's also a kind of response, a kind of pitiful response to their absence of authority and the absence of their integration into traditional channels of social control, such as the church or the union. These elites had lost the ability to command assent. Likewise, for non-elites, the theory of crowds promised a way of changing and remaking society at a time when forms of organization or channels for directing change were weakening or absent. The non-elites and the political radicals they lost their feeling for political persuasion, lost their feeling that political persuasion could be successful. What unites both is the feeling of confronting a mass society where there are no constituted groups that can be appealed to based on defined interests. So instead of this, instead of that, they have to peer into people's minds, try and manipulate and stir the masses to action through images and symbols. So in this mass society, Psychology becomes a kind of constant temptation, I think, and not, and what I'm stressing is that it starts as, as a sociological explanation, which is kind of sympathetic. Whatever the truth of that, whatever the value in an analysis of mass society though, I think the key thing to remember, going back to John Kerry, who I mentioned when we opened, is that, quote, the masses do not exist. The mass is a metaphor which denies to people the individuality which we describe to ourselves and to the people we know. The overwhelming feeling, you may have had this too, reading some of this literature, is one of mystification. Poetic phrases, underhand similes, subtle metaphors, they're all introduced to give the crowd a meaning, that give the mass a feeling as a distinctive social group, a sort of reality that it doesn't have. It's therefore sort of up to us, as it were, to reclaim the individual interpersonal perspective. The standpoint of persuasion, action, argument, free discourse is not one that we can drop in favor of talk of drives, forces, and impression management just because society's become too big or too impersonal to control. Indeed, 
it may only become too big or too impersonal if we all give up on those essential elements of democratic society. Whatever the pretenses of mass psychology to reveal to us the uniformity of the human mind, we are not constituted by our inner desires and drives, however predictable they may be. And so we cannot, in the last analysis, be understood through mass psychology. Indeed, we disprove the perspective of mass society and the psychological theories that have come to control it each and every time we reveal ourselves or solicit the revelation of others. In other words, the responsibility of freedom, the freedom to do and to say, and the responsibility to make the world a fit place for other people to do and to say, that's the proper starting point for politics, not the psychology of the masses that I've outlined here today. Thanks. Jacob, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, uh, both a, a kind of excellent uh, walk through um, uh, a very complicated uh, intellectual history uh, that is now uh, far clearer in my mind um, with a lovely uh, call to arms at the end. Okay, so the way in which this now uh, works, folks, uh, as we kind of go on to debate some of what Jacob has discussed. So I've first got um, Harley. Thanks, uh, Jacob putting that together so well, all that stuff. Um, first is, uh, it struck me reading the crowd that Le Bon sees the individual as rational, uh, but uh, when that individual becomes part of a crowd, they become irrational. But so one thing about that is that at least he recognizes the rationality of the individual. But modern behaviorism doesn't even grant that, it seems to me. Um, it sees the individual as inherently irrational from the get-go and driven by unconscious factors. So could, could you maybe say a little bit more about how that transition happens? And secondly, um, you said about uh, this sort of shift to behaviorism was not conceived as an immoral enterprise. And it made me think of another Enlightenment figure, uh, Immanuel Kant, who studied in previous academies. Um, and, you know, his big, big, big uh, message was, um, you know, we treat people as ends, not means. That is, to be, that is what it means to be good. And the opposite is evil, treating people as uh, means to an end. Uh, so in Kant's term, surely manipulation involved in behaviorism is evil. Uh, so the question is, to what extent, if any, was there any recognition or discussion of that conflict at the time? Was there any pushback or was, were there behaviorists pushing at an open door? Okay, Harley, thank you. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring Jacob back in uh, in a few minutes. So I'm going to take a number of points before I invite Jacob to, to come back. So I've got Jane uh, next. Okay, uh, thanks, Jacob. That was wonderful. I just wondered if you could expand on what you, how you would fight for uh, the idea of that democratic, ununiformed individual. Um, so a relationship, presumably, between objectivity but as you were saying we're also not uniform as well so how how that balance and it just seems to me such a hardest thing to argue or think about now so if you think about the recent events around something like black lines lives matters which seems to be all very much how we act on a subconscious level so even if we rationally think we're anti-racist we actually subconsciously aren't and 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 organize around our subconscious and so um, how, we, how we think about that, I guess, which does seem to be such a predominant way of understanding us in the world. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, Frank, who's going to be lecturing later. Oh, it's very nice, uh, Jacob. Uh, just a couple of historical points. The key moment in the development of mass psychology and the politicization of psychology is in the 1940s. Because in the 1940s, what happens is that uh, mass psychology develops both a, a, a positive utopian strand, where it sees psychology as, as a, a medium through which social transformation can occur, and also at the same time, psychology acquires a very negative, uh, sort of conservative uh, side to it. Uh, and both of them exist side by side. I think what happens in the 1940s is that the emphasis moves away of, from the masses in the way that they were originally conceived uh, because of the whole experience of fascism and Nazi Germany as a kind of reaction against that. And increasingly, particularly in the United States, psychology becomes devoted to taking children at a very, very young age and using young children as the medium through which a new world could be created, 
by getting them away from their parents and from traditional society and putting them under the wing of psychologists who are going to, in a sense, reform them so they no longer have these horrible uh, unconscious urges and these authoritarian personalities. And it's interesting to note that that uh, utopian vision continues on until about the 1970s when increasingly it kind of comes to an end and psychology loses its utopian dimension, uh, more or less, except in relation to identity, where in identity politics has this new version, which uh, is called raising awareness and through that some individual solutions can, can really occur. But I think what's very interesting about the negative side of uh, psychology, which kind of mutates into uh, a concern with individual identity in the 1970s, is that it ceases to be merely a tool used by the elites to manipulate uh, the masses. It still you know, plays that kind of a role. It becomes embraced and internalized into general culture, and it reappears uh, as a demand for recognition. It reappears as a, as a statement where people voluntarily diagnose themselves as being ill. They don't have to wait anymore to be told that they're sick or ill. They now diagnose themselves as being ill. And therefore what happens is that it's almost as if they, they become the self-fulfilling uh, sort of projections of what mass psychology was in the 19th century. And that's what we have today, where you have people on the streets screaming and yelling that I'm traumatized, I'm hurt, I'm damaged, I'm emotional, you made me emotionally ill. And you kind of put yourself into that role into which you were assigned more than 100 years ago by Christ psychologists. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I've got Noah next. Um... Hello. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Really, really great points. Um, just a few bits from me. First, I wonder what you thought, um, to what extent sort of uniformity is shaped not by sort of fear of a state, but more about fear of um, social disapproval and shaming from individuals. So almost within a crowd, there could be um, social disapproval. And we've seen that even, you know, today when certainly in the UK, religious influence is uh, far lower. Um, secondly, we've seen that, you know, what can be peaceful protests of crowds can easily turn violent. And I wonder sort of to what extent you thought that for some individuals who might have gone along to a protest with the you know intention of being peaceful they may have thought that the only way to show their solidarity with, with a specific cause is by following uh, the methods of the most radical protesters and so hence they inadvertently uh, end up protesting violently uh, and finally i wonder what you thought in terms of looking at the elites the crowd in themselves both in the uniformity of what they think and how they project that ideology onto uh, the demos thank you very much no, thank you. Um, I've got quite a lot of hands up. Um, I'm, I'm going to take Phil and Tom and then just see if Jacob wants to come back and respond to, to some of these points and then come back out. So um, I've, I've got Phil. It seems, it seems to me a central question in this um, that was raised was essentially <clears throat> to defend the importance of the individual. Do we have to pretend that people are more rational than they are? Um, the argument seemed to me was framed that um, I, I love the movement from Plato to Freud. So Plato has reason versus appetite. Um, and Freud updates that appetite is the id and the ego is reason, the attempt to control the id. But what is missing in many ways is the superego. Freud's great insight, I feel, is that we are obsessed with authority, either having it or giving it away. Um, and so I'm not convinced that we have to try to pretend people, I don't, I don't think there's any, any reason to read history or any way of reading history that suggests we're actually all rational creatures. I think Freud's insight is fundamentally crucial and it's crucial not only in understanding the human being, but crucial in understanding what we do politically afterwards. So emerging from all of the things that have been said and, and the lecture, it seemed the key question was, what is our idea of what a human being is? Do we have a progressive idea of the individual? Are individuals improvable? And, ra and if they're rational, then presumably they are. Or, and I think the phrase that was used was, we are, we are not a product of our desires and drives. I just don't think that's true. And I think, but it's really important that we decide that or work that out because if, if it is true, if we're rational, then politics takes on a different kind of form. And if we're not rational, then it seems to me we're trying to pretend we're more rational because if we're not, then we're at the whim of behaviorists or psychologists or whatever who can manipulate us. 
And I want to know, is there not another way of thinking about this? Is there not a way that we can accept a sort of fundamental irrationality, the fact that we are driven by desires, by authority beyond what we can control, but yet we have to make politics happen in the middle of that. In other words, we take a tragic view of humanity, an existentialist view of what the human subject is, but we have to try and make democracy work anyway, not rush back into pretending we're more rational than we are, not rush to move away from what the what that means about the power of behavioral scientists or advertisers or whatever, which may well be true and 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 damages potentially damages what we want to do democratically as as subjects. But how how do we hold those things in tension? Because I don't think the rush back towards rationality is going to <coughs> make political movements that we need that we need to make. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm going to let uh, uh, Jacob come back in. Um, and perhaps kick off responding to that kind of challenge and, uh, uh, that you've set. Um, but I just said I was going to take Tom first, so just while Jacob is reflecting on that, Tom. It's Rosie, sorry, with Tom's name. Rosie, go for it. I don't okay. say much. Uh, so I just wondered um, to what extent were the ideas about um, crowd psychology influenced by the rise of um, mass production um, and the organisation of workforces into machine-like uh, repetitive sort of behaviours. Is it the case that because of that there was a sort of, I mean there was a horror at what that produced in terms of uh, you know the human cost of, of that organisation of work um, and, and then perhaps is it, is it the case of sort of them blaming the the victim, you want to put it like that, because uh, people were organized into working in that way is that feeding into some of those ideas so that was one point and then i just wanted to ask about because arendt in the um, origins of totalitarianism makes a distinction between the crowd and the mob um, with the mob there is a a heightened um degree of irrationality and uh uh, being caught up and emotionalism, but with the the crowd, I think she makes a, a the distinction is about the there is a common interest at work with a crowd, but not with a mob. Rosie, thank you. Um, Jacob, do you want to come back on uh, uh, some of this, not all of it, but but do you want to just uh, uh, give us a, a couple of thoughts, and then I'll go back out for some more questions and contributions. Yeah, I, I, I mean. Little times I won't say much, not these, because I'm nowhere quick to answer some of those excellent questions because they're things that I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like more time to think about, but nonetheless, don't have. But so, I mean, a, a couple of disconnected thoughts. The first is that, so while my story, as it were, sort of stopped short in the sort of uh, end of the 1960s, as it were, it, it's obviously true that past that, one of the things that happens is that the professional uh, authority of psychology comes into question without the sort of central categories of psychology being questioned. And so that's why you have, I think, as some of as Harley, I think, put it, the sort of the whereas the irrational was located with the masses and the rational with the individual, it then all sort of somehow gets reincorporated back into the individual as the uh, the sort of authority of the, of the discipline of psychology becomes discredited, but people are taking it upon themselves to implement the sort of insights or ideas of psychology in their own head, as it were. Um, again, lots of other good points. I mean, of course, no, like, nobody would want to say that the thing to do is to just insist blindly that there's no rationality and that everybody's a sort of brilliant sort of calculator of rational value or anything like that. And I think it raises the 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 point really that the i mean we're in to some degree we're as rational um as our circumstances and our uh, sort of social culture allows and so we have to always attempt to the what i think one of the things that phil you were getting at was that a progressive view of the human being that to me also implies a sort of progressive view of society and a progress that we have to try and remake together the conditions under which we can exercise, exercise our rationality and lead our lives in more rational terms. And that one of, there'll of course be sort of biases or impulses that we come up as it were against in our own head, but there are also sort of structural deficiencies that we cumulatively have to come together um, and get at. And I think that it's hard to describe or ascertain some sort of primacy, but one thing to say is that the, for me, 
or the way I see it is that the major problem of these um, descriptions of the human being as rational or irrational or machine-like or crowd-like machine-like, as Rose even nicely put it, is not that they're untrue, but the more that we believe them, the more they have a tendency to become true. The more that they occupy the prime place as a metaphor for us in our culture, we behave according to that. So the danger of that standpoint is not necessarily that it's wrong on some sort of essential scientific level, but that it becomes a sort of metaphor through which we understand and then act ourselves and as a society. Jacob, thank you. Okay, th th this may be a, a, a question I think that is going to run through as, as it kind of underpins uh, much of our discussion. I've got Richard, Phil, and then Jenny. Um, so Richard, over Thanks, to you. James. Thanks, James. Um, Get Brexit done, said the, uh, today's Gustave Le Bon, um, not that long ago. Black Lives Matter uh, seems to be um, a um, five-syllable slogan, four-syllable slogan, which is, uh, has gripped the masses or gripped a certain section of the masses. I guess that my question is, what's, what's the problem uh, with these apparently, what you might describe as manipula um, manipulative slogans? I is there anything particularly wrong with something which manages to sum up perhaps the desire of a section of the population and, and encapsulate that and motivate people to do something. Uh, that's one question. I'm also slightly nervous about the casual way that the word manipulation has been uh, thrown around uh, already actually. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that that's a particularly useful term. Uh, it suggests a, a certain amount of uh, uh, irrationality and that, you know, uh, um, what's his name, um, the, the fellow I just, uh, you know, get Brexit done. Uh, Dominic Cummings said, you know, it, it kind of turns him into something which perhaps he's not, insofar as he's not a manipulator, uh, even if he might, uh, or he probably wouldn't consider himself to be, uh, to be that. I'm a bit worried about that. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Phil, over to you. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to give a, uh, I think a complimentary um, uh, uh, sort of anecdote from, from the interwar years. But just before I do that, I think just to, to comment on, on the other Phil's point, I, I think it's, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, kind of posing is everybody, is, 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 is the, are the people irrational or rational? I mean, we can always find the fact that individuals do a lot of irrational things. We all do a lot of stupid things and so on. Um, but I think the humanist position is to say that people have, a, people have an innate capacity to reason uh, and to be able to uh, discuss and argue and come to uh, different perspectives on things. So uh, you're, you're, I don't think it's a matter of kidding ourselves then, because yes, of course, you can always find stupid things that people do and stupid uh, decisions that people take. But I think it is fundamental to humanist politics to say that we are uh, fundamentally able and, uh, and have that uh, perspicacity to, to, to discuss and to reason. And I think that I would put that as the, the starting point for this discussion. On the, the vignette I wanted to add to uh, Jacob's fascinating uh, uh, presentation is one from the interwar years. Um, uh, and in the reading around this, uh, what seems quite quite a little sort of a pivotal institution that was set up in uh, Freud's uh, Vienna, which was the, the Research Centre for Economic Psychology. Uh, and it sort of points to uh, another intellectual strand, which, which Jacob didn't obviously have time to, to look at, which is the psychologizing of, of economic phenomena. Um, but but more, more pertinent to sort of one of the links in the way ideas developed um, was the sort of discussions that took place around this institute. Now, the institute was set up by, by Paul Lazarsfeld, the, uh, the sociologist, left-wing sociologist. And it was set up uh, with the intention of finding psychological solutions to Austria's economic problems. And in that, it's, you know, was typical of the thinking that was going on in other parts of the economic profession, what we obviously know most uh, 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 explicitly in terms of John Maynard Keynes and the importance of animal spirits and propensity to consume and so on. Um, but this institute, which was also known as the, uh, the, the Psychoeconomic Institute, uh, um, was looking at ways in which um, uh, the, uh, the crisis of the, the economic crisis of the interwar years perhaps had a, had a, uh, a root within the way society was psychologically driven and the motivations and so on. But also pertinent within that, was that uh, Lazarsfeld was part of the left wing uh, uh, movement there, which was also uh, trying to grapple with why its socialist ideas were having so little purchase. So 
one of the discussions which went on within this institute uh, was to try to say, is there something about uh, you know, Austrian mass society psychologically, which explains the, um, the lack of purchase of their, of their, of their left-wing ideas. Why, and, and I think that points to one of the, the mediating links in this, in this journey, which is the left's sort of political disappointments and frustrations, which is one of the things that made them uh, uh, turn to Freud, um, whom, whom Lazarfeld saw as who's, who's in, that, in that tradition. Uh, to, to conclude on this, the, the other link um, to what we'll be discussing later is that this institute also has one of its members was Ernst Dichter, who then went on to develop motivational research. So it's quite an important little institution, both as an expression of the psychologizing of economics, which from the interwar years has become more and more dominant, we know, in terms of discussions of confidence, feel good factors, and all those sort of things which are so uh, uh, pervasive today but also in terms of, that, as I say, an example of that link of the defeat of the left politically and what that meant. So fascinating, thank you. Um, Jenny. I like the fact that Jacob actually defended Freud from the point of view of actually developing um, psychology from a scientific point of view. And I must say, I've always adopted that position that Freud had something very positive to say about psychology. Picking up, though, on Phil's point about the interwar period, what is so interesting about Freud is having had an extremely, I think, advanced um, theory of human psychology, actually, in, after the, the, the rise of Hitler, um, becomes ex changes completely adopts some very, very irrational ideas, particularly with his development of this idea of the destructive or death instinct. Um, but just very, very quickly to sort of emphasize the point that before this, Freud really made this important distinction between the ego, the id, and the superego to try and explain the relationship between the individual and society and sort of in the development of the individual. And the important points he made about the ego in relation to the instincts was that the ego actually, through, through the development of, of human beings, the ego increasingly got control over the id, in other words, over the instincts, was able to actually um, control those, monitor them, and intellectually um, then become, uh, um, if you like, a whole person in control of instincts and able to act in the world accordingly, that increasingly it was, the ego was able to act on the world. However, remember, Hitler comes to power in 33, you know, in 33. In, in, in 33, um, ironically, Freud's books are actually burned in Berlin. And Freud then turns his attention to looking at society and culture and starts really trying to address this, this point about the irrationality of the crowds and the, the rise of um, you know, Hitler and the fact that he, he commands this mass movement Freud's ideas then turn to the irrational, that this idea that instincts actually can supervene all these old instincts, and particularly, as I said, this completely irrational category of the destructive instinct uh, comes to the fore. So I think it's important to realize that Freud actually underwent a turn, and quite a lot of his, his subsequent popularity actually focused in on that irrationality and the sort of idea of the instincts, instincts dominating uh, human psychology. Jenny, that's really very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so I've got Max and then I've got Andrew and then I've got a, a, a kind of increasing number of people who all want to speak. I'm, I'm going to try and fit everyone in uh, uh, in the next 20 minutes and also give Jacob a chance to, to come back on things. So just, um, just to let you know, I'll, I'll try to take everyone. If, 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 if you're kind of uh, as concise as you can be in what you're saying, that would be great. And then a couple of people have messaged to say, could I, I, you might just want to note, um, if you're not uh, raising your hand at the moment, 
Uh, if you haven't uh, worked in Zoom before, there is a, a bit of chat going on uh, in the chat and you may well want to post some thoughts or ideas there for people to uh, reflect on. Um, Max, over to you. Uh, Jacob, thanks for that. That was, that was incredibly uh, interesting. I suppose two sort of quick things I'd love to get your thoughts on. The first, I suppose, is to do with the kind of uh, the context of the environment in which um, in which individuals sort of make decisions, if you like. And so, uh, obviously, um, you know, when you were talking about uh, Freud and lots being said about him, uh, it sort of reminded me of uh, one of his colleagues in Vienna, Otto Rank, who I had to remind myself of what the book was called, uh, Beyond Psychology. Uh, and he talks about this kind of relativity of, of psychological systems. And he was talking about, uh, like Frank and Jenny have, have brought up this idea that, you know, uh, the war period kind of changed everything and how uh, the sort of reliance on different psychological systems changed because of it. Um, but he also was talking about within the individual. And so I think, you know, if we move to kind of present day and nudge theory, a lot of a lot of stuff is uh, spoken about not, uh, I suppose, manipulating people by changing what they call this terrifying phrase, the choice architecture. And so I, I was wondering uh, if you could comment on the role of, of both the context in which, you know, decisions are made by individuals and also the environment in which those individuals find themselves, because obviously, you know, in, in one way we may behave uh, irrationally or, or rationally, but say uh, in an emergency um, and whether there's anything about you know 21st century society that causes that you know people have spoken about social media and the sort of uh, temporal dissolution that it causes meaning that everyone's in this kind of uh, you know William Davis calls it this constant nervous state so that was one thing that very quickly the other thing I suppose uh, Frank mentioned the sort of uh, pathologization of, of the human condition um, you know, in this idea of, of people being depressed with that, people being diagnosed with all these labels and how that's increased. And I, I suppose I wanted to get a comment on how you see those two things interacting, because it does seem to, to, to me that this kind of increased uh, reliance on psychology as a way of sort of highlighting what's wrong with us. Um, uh, it seems to be apparent, but also, you know, you talked about this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, this idea of labels and, you know, you tell someone they're depressed, they can go to Wikipedia, they can look up all the symptoms uh, and they'll probably start feeling some of the other, other symptoms. So this kind of, uh, I suppose, both of my questions are about this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, whether that's creating an environment so that people act in a certain way, which you can then say is, you know, uh, predictable and also giving people labels so that, yeah, they, they, they sort of start to become those labels. Max, thank you. Um, I've got Andrew and then Eve. So, Andrew, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jacob, very much. Um, I've got two propositions I'd like to put to you for your comments and uh, indirectly other people's, I guess. Um, the first is this. Um, latterly, it seems to me, psychologizers don't really use the template of the crowd, still less mass society um they're much more likely to use as a kind of reference point something that is akin to a subculture and there are subcultures or identities as they're now more recently rebadged that are judged to be good and others that are judged or said to be not so good but um in the shorthand version of this proposition is that the very idea of mass society uh, uh, could, it's too close to the universal uh, for today's psychologizing elites to be comfortable with it. Uh, so they don't, it seems to be very often refer to it. Um, the other proposition is, should we just junk rational and irrational as a couplet? I think there's more explanatory power in the couplet of subject and object that is to say aspects of our lives in which we are the subjects of what we do other aspects of our lives in which we are objectified we are the object of forces beyond our control and the reason why i propose that's a better couplet is because um, whether we are subjects or objects um and indeed existing in the contradiction between them um there's a logic to what we do uh, whereas the couplet of rational and irrational uh, 
uh, concedes that on lots of occasions, people just lose it um, and become somehow less than human, which is why I think that couplet is uh, of less use to us and maybe we should abandon it altogether. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, Eve, over to you. Uh, given the massive fear around COVID-19, where we've seen a sort of existential and often irrational fear of um, the disease, and also the events around Black Lives Matter um, and the sort of illiberal um, politics that we've seen around um, the, 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 the question of the statues and, the, and what have you, um, it, would, it, would, it seems to me that the issue of freedom and therefore the issue of human psychology is still uh, relevant. And, and those are often the terms that people um, talk in as well. You know, people um, still debate Freud and still talk about the conscious and unconscious, however much we might want to junk some of those categories um, and however, however useful new categories could be. In that respect, is there anything that we can learn from the utopian wing of social psychology that Frank mentioned? And the one person who hasn't been mentioned in the discussion is the German Jew, Eric Fromm, who, um, who did also take from, he took psychology from, uh, you know, and the, the discovery of the unconscious mind from uh, Freud and he also had an understanding of capitalism class society that he took from Marx and he identified the so-called authoritarian personality as, as the a kind of immature person who had not um, who wasn't independent who wasn't autonomous who was fearful and isolated who hadn't you know who wasn't connected to the world and who therefore looked to authority to, to bond um, uh, and, and therefore, you know, was 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 fearful of freedom, um, and the mature person had connected with the world, and did ha could util utilize their reason to uh, figure stuff out, and therefore, you know, embraced um, freedom. So, uh, you know, of course, and he was a social psychologist. Um, and I'm not saying that he he had everything right, but he does seem he it does seem relevant in today's politics where you we've got the um, bizarre and awful spectre of the so-called progressive you know wing of society uh, who have completely in, integrated the politics of fear, usually associated with the right, into um, their whole outlook and and everything they do. Okay, thank you, Eve. Um, I, I'm going to, if I can, uh, just carry on taking more points, and I'm going to let Jacob come in. Uh, I know we want to hear his reflections, but I'm going to let Jacob come in just at the end to try and uh, round things up. So we're, we're running into the final kind of um, uh, five minutes or so of, of this session before Jacob comes back. Um, and I've got uh, Felice, uh, over to you. Um, hi, um, it's... Um, concerning you were talking about, Jacob, uh, the no platforming um, on universities, um, and I was thinking that uh, as a student myself, um, like what that means for education in general, if we're kind of taking this idea of mass psychology into education and into universities, because we hear a lot this idea that we young people are very impressionable and um, and we, and therefore sort of the ideas that we're that we hear are the ones that we will adopt. Um, but as I see it, univer our university should be a place where we hear many things and then sort of decide for ourselves what we take as the most, um, as the best position there. Um, so I was just thinking that this also sort of, like what this does for students and what we then do as individuals at a university if we're just supposed to hear the right ideas and then adopt those. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Fiona, over to you. Um, yeah, just on the um, sort of trying to reconcile these ideas of um, individual freedom, but also, you know, sort of real crowd phenomena. I'm just wondering if it's interesting to look at modern phenomena, like things like social media mobbing, you know, sort of Twitter mobs and so on. 
Um, you know, so obviously you can make the argument that people are rational, but then you do get these instances of, of, sort of cases where people do, you know, probably people who think that they're beyond, you know, sort of above that and think that they are rational by and large will get sucked into these sort of group phenomena with this very strict policing of what people can say and, you know, very emotional and so on. Um, so, and, and there's a, an interesting book called uh, by John Ronson by, it called uh, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which is quite interesting on this and a lot of these sorts of examples. I'm just wondering if it's helpful to think about some of these situations where people could sort of move between that sort of being individually rational and then getting sucked into sort of certain crowd phenomena and how you sort of understand that and how, how people reconcile those things. But it's also when you think about that, a lot of what that does sort of takes the, the sort of policing of social norms that you might imagine as part of sort of almost village culture, but online. So there's not, you know, in some ways it's not something new. It's about taking, um, you know, the sort of set of social norms, which might be, you know, sort of change over time and then really strictly policing them. So I think then we also have to understand, you know, is that always a bad thing? Obviously, sometimes the way that that manifests, depending on what your values are, it seems very negative. Um, but it does sort of tie into something that is, you know, very real um, sense of community and feelings of belonging and um, having a shared set of values that you have to police um, sort of collectively and so on. So I think it's just, in, you know, we need to sort of try and think about how these things, um, how you reconcile the sort of you know, sense of individual freedom and responsibility with these more um, group and community phenomenon, because you can't really dis dismiss that. Okay, thanks, Fiona. Cronin. Um, just two, two very quick questions. One was, did Le Bon and Weber ever uh, correspond? The uh, Weber re uh, reading on this, the, the whole charismatic authority, um, the role of the almost the crowd in selecting its leader, that uh, Weber was very, I always thought, very sophisticated in, in seeming to invert that, that rather than the charismatic leaders, it was crowds who selected their leader. Uh, and that the you know the charisma of, of the leader is something that the crowd attributes to it. And there seems to be a very strong parallel with Le Bon. And the other issue is consent. That Le Bon is uh, makes very very many interesting points about um, the worst atrocities in history being having the complicity of the crowd. Um, I wonder how much if we think about contemporary events and obviously the last sort of like three or four weeks. We look at um, the whole idea of silence that uh, obviously historically Le Bon takes the idea of complicity in the crowd, complicity in massacres and so forth as being characteristic of the crowd being, being irrational. Um, it seems in the last month or so the idea of non-action, inaction, is being problematised. Um, I'd just I'd be interested to know what people's thoughts were about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Josephine. Yeah, lovely. Um, I was just interested in um, what well, was kind of spurred by Phil's point about what it, what is human and also the point that Frank made about um, the move towards um, the focus on children in the 1940s, um, from the 1940s, um, which I think is really, really true. And obviously one of the things, obviously we're talking about the psycho psychologicalization of humans, but um, what what is fundamental to us is the social um, and I what I'm interested in is where does the rational object subject whatever you want to call it it only becomes apparent in the social um, and I thought the kind of move in education towards um, the utopian idea of the child and the move towards the child um, does that in a way deny the social because for me um, the Vygotskyan idea of the child being drawn slowly into the social by the adults um, and teaching the children of the rules of society that are formed by rational or subject-led individuals is really, really important. And if we move away from that and say that actually we can't lead them, they have to lead us. For me, is the child in a way um, an irrational human being who needs the social to actually become a fully formed, active human being. And this kind of leads into the point that Nancy made on the chat about the fact that we have lost authority. Um, we've lost this sense of authority. Um, and I'm on the point about Black Lives Matters. What interests me about this is, you know, people are called out on social media for being racist um, and they go straight to their employees. They don't actually say to, to someone, um, what you've just said is racist. They go somewhere else for an authority 
And so there's this kind of, particularly today, this desire not to engage in the social, um, which is why there appears to be this mass, irrational Brilliant. mass. Thank you very much, Josephine. Okay, so I'm going to take everyone who's had their hand up for a while um, and just run over by uh, a couple of minutes so that I can let Jacob come in to um, run things up. So, Nancy. Uh, I just wanted to come back to this remark that uh, Frank made about the 1970s, because I think what happens in the 1970s, and one of the reasons why psych, uh, psycho, uh, or psychology begins to apparently decline, is, is actually its success, because what we start doing is we start raising children and socializing them differently, so that the new source of authority um, is the self itself. Um, and people deeply internalize this. And this is a real problem because um, uh, if everything is relative to the self, um, then it makes it very difficult to have any fixed points um, in society, um, uh, which is, I think, where the drive to, you know, sort of get rid of the, the um, uh, male and female in favor of the authentic self comes from. And that's difficult because rational thought requires fixed points. Uh, it, re it requires a binary. Um, and um, I, I, it creates a really unstable situation where um, uh, today it's very difficult for people to stay rational for any uh, amount of time because, um, uh, because it's constantly subjective. It creates this con constant overturning. And that really comes down to a problem of not having an external source of authority. Nancy, thank you. Rob. Hi there. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I had two quite quick points. One, one on Freud. Um, there's an important concept in philosophy of mind and philosophy of cognitive science, which is my field, which is um, folk psychology. And I think an important thing about Freud is how he creates concepts which everybody uses to think about and theorize themselves. So this idea of the subconscious, the unconscious, um, you know, really changes how you, human beings consider themselves and what they consider the source of their actions to be. And this is very important. And this sort of brings me to a little, little criticism, which is despite this absolutely fascinating discussion, it seems to me there's a huge theoretical hole, which is the last 70 years of cognitive psychology, which has also changed our consideration of what human beings are and particularly what reasoning is. And so there are tremendous resources which have been challenged to an extent now, which are, you know, have been formed really since the 1950s running up to today. And this is the mainstream of psychology. You can have a very good argument about whether and how this has become part of our folk psychology, about how to what extent everyday human beings really use these ideas to think about themselves. But nevertheless, this is the psychology of today. And I think in a way, without bringing some consideration of this, which certainly I can't do now, but maybe the I uh, might want to think about in the future, without bringing some consideration of this in, you have a kind of almost a one dimensional idea of psychology. It's a bit like Freud, and then suddenly we've got um, nudging and there's nothing in between. Well, there's 70 years of thought in between and really needs to be taken a bit more account of. Okay. Really interesting contribution. Thank you. Um, Joel, and then I've got Sabina, and then uh, Jacob's going to come back in. Joel, over to you. Um, thank you. I think Max, in some way, hit the nail on the head of some aspects that I was thinking of, um, especially in using the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy. And I wonder, I'm really sympathetic to kind of J Jacob's earlier response that said, you know, these are kind of the conditions that you find yourself in having to make decisions about things and whether or not you see yourself as a mass or not doesn't matter but yeah I think a, a better theory of what a self-fulfilling prophecy looks like and its harms is quite analytically useful um, but that does come with some problems that I'm not quite sure how to reconcile because as soon as you start using kind of big categories, you get into terms of analysis, which start seeing people as being in some way duped or not representing their real essence or, or, or you know, deriving too much from facts about them that, that we don't think matter on a normative level. Um, and the attempts to explain this either as kind of nudge today or demographic analysis or uh, lo lots of these different forms of analysis seem to kind of fall short of the mark or take on too much normative content. So I'm wondering kind of how do you analyze um, some of these processes without just falling back into the kind of psychological 
um, pitfalls that we've been talking about. Joel, thank you. Reporting from location. Um, and finally, Sabina. So um, there's just one point, uh, short point, and I'm a bit worried that we might have too much of a distinction between the Enlightenment and the modern psychological debate, because I don't believe that the Enlightenment theoreticians neglected psychology. So I think psychology was very important to them. If you look at Rousseau, who said many of the things which were later picked up by both Freud, uh, who had a great influence on Freud, um, and I don't think, you know, somebody like Kant was very aware of uh, mob violence. So there was a lot of mob violence and irrationality going on at the time. But the point I think they were making is that, you know, the famous internal moral law that within everybody, there was the, the ability to, to distinguish between good and evil. And we never know in certain situations how individuals will react. And I suppose you can say that about fascism. So I've been doing a bit of reading on, on fascism. So, you know, the interesting thing is not, to me, it's interesting how many people went along with a sort of fascist ideology, but it is also interesting to see how many people didn't and actually went out of their way um, to show quite a bit of um, uh, courage, you know, saying that we know that what is happening here is wrong. And you never know, knew beforehand which individual would be on which side. And that's the kind of thing I, I noticed in Brexit too, you know, the question is, which side are you on? So I think, you know, all, every debate about psychology has to somehow be linked with a, with a debate about morals. So I was going to, I'm just wondering what Jacob has to say about that. Sabina, thank you. Okay, um, Jacob, um, uh, over to you again. Um, not, to, uh, uh, not to sum up all of this, this has been an excellent start. So thank you everyone for your contributions and for your, uh, um, the, the, the points that you made in the chat. It's a really great start to the day. Um, Jacob, over to you just to give us some um, reflections on anything that you want to pick up uh, for a couple of minutes. Jacob. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the, wow. Thanks. The, those. No way I'm going to be able to uh, deal with any of that. But it, it's great that that we, we could have this conversation. I mean, so just to skim through a few things. The first, I mean, the the point about what was going on in Vienna. I, the, the more I read, one of the things I keep find, finding, Vienna. What a period, like pre-post interwar Vienna is like. Well, what a period. And I feel like I need to. We we'd all repay sort of going and just studying that period. So there's so much going on just in Vienna. It's like a laboratory for much of the trends that we find today. But specifically on the economics of it and how economics is understood. Phil, I think, Phil Mullen there made a series of really great points. Um, one thing I'd stress just to add to it is that I think there's a tremendous amount of continuity between the uh, increased sort of psychological understandings of, beha of economic behavior, what now becomes known as behavioral economics, and indeed the sort of traditional Austrian school economics, both begin with the assumption fundamentally that human beings are irreparably hopeless and irrational at organizing their lives and so need, and so try and find mechanisms to help us out. It's just that with the Austria, the traditional Austrian school, it's the market that does all the work, that synthesizes all this information. Whereas, of course, with the behavioral economists, it's sort of them in their laboratories and using all of this data that figure it out. Um, okay, then what I wanted to say was, so, yeah, the, so somebody raised the point about um, the sort of flight away from mass phenomena as maybe being too universalistic. And I think that makes a really good point because there's a tendency, I think, to try and find identities or subcultures or um, and define these cultures. And there's also a... a Jim in his introduction talked about um, the work being done by Stephen Riker and, and other people to understand how we do, draw in-group or out-group distinctions and how important that is for uh, whether people obey instructions or trust authorities. And I think whilst it's been sort of submerged, they are still grappling, I think, with this question of uh, mass, mass society. They're either on the hand of the people who seek to find ever new identities or subcultures, seeking in some sense a sort of conjure um, social groupings into existence where they don't really exist or as with the sort of a uh, Riker school which has obviously got a lot to add but with the sort of Riker school that that represent they're trying to uh, avoid drawing these distinctions and drawing and avoid drawing these boundaries between in-group and out-group and so at a political level I think one of the things that leads to is you see increasingly the sort of ways in which we try and grapple with the public are in increasingly I mean, slogans are increasingly sort of devoid of content. I was just thinking the other day about imagine contrasting the sort of material demands, whatever you make of it, of peace, bread and land with Black Lives Matter. 
It's like the, the latter has almost no content to it. It just is an assertion, whereas the former att attempts to motivate some people based on specific interests. And so I think that's part of this problem being grappled with, with mass society. So then what do we do? So two things. The first leading from that is that I think it is incumbent upon lots of us. And again, this good point about moving away from uh, sort of subject, uh, sort of irrational and irrational and finding new ways to cast this. One thing we can do is that if it's such a problem now to try and find uh, social groupings and we can't just conjure them into existence or invent them, we have to do what we can to reclaim uh, from the perspective of mass society or from the sort of atomization that the individual perspective, that seeing everyone as just isolated individuals puts it, we have to try and sort of reclaim some distinctions or mediating influences, whether these are the family or your groups or social groups that you have of your own. We keep being told we live in a global village, which as somebody rightly pointed out, Lee, sort of has all of the downsides of villages, such as their sort of gossipy nature with none of the upsides, which is that they, in some sense, as small social groups do, is they protect or mediate between the effects of the whole wide world and allow people a chance of reclaiming some power um, in those spaces. So I think it's up to us to try and reclaim and nurture some of those spaces where human freedom or the ability to have an effect on the world can be exercised as a meaningful reality. The second is that following from Sabina's excellent points about, uh, Sabina's excellent point, is that it's all also incumbent on us to reclaim the space for reflection that was ultimately the precondition for what those enlightenment figures thought of as the moral law. It was the, the ability to with, withdraw from the world, find a dialogue with ourselves and create the space where we could then, once we are able to figure things out from ourselves, detach ourselves from Twitter or unplug from social media or whatever it is, and enjoy a dialogue with ourselves and ensure that that space um, is, is the one that's reclaimed. So I think you could sort of cast it as against the tendency to think of people predictably or psychologically or irrationally or as perfectly rational. Conversely, it's about reclaiming certain sorts or, or better still creating certain sorts of spaces. Those on the one hand that allow us to exercise power together and on the other hand, allow us to think things through for ourselves. Jacob, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, uh, leading us in a really um, excellent discussion. Um, and, and thank you to everyone who's contributed. That's a, a fantastic start to the day. Um.